Welcome, everyone. My name is uh, Siamak Molemi. I am a professor here and the director of the Brigger Family uh, Digital Finance Lab. And on behalf of the lab and also on uh, behalf of my co-host, uh, Professor uh, Harry um, Miamski from uh, the, the Program for, for Digital Finance, I wanted to welcome you all here today um, for a presentation um, by, uh, by Victor Hagani. Um, I'll just do a, um, a, a brief intro. Um, Victor is, is obviously uh, has a, an illustrious uh, history in, in, in finance, and um, uh, many of you uh, know of him. Um, uh, but um, uh, perhaps he's um, uh, most famous for, for a few things, for, for working in the Salman um, Brothers Bond Arbitrage Group, uh, um, uh, famous from uh, um, a Liar's Poker and uh, um, uh, other things, and then moving on to a, um, a long-term capital management, where he was a, a, a partner there in the, in, in the 90s and um, uh, most recently um, uh, a principal at uh, um, uh, Elm. And um, Victor is here today to um, uh, um, tell us about uh, um, some ideas from his book, The Missing Billionaires, which is co-written with his uh, co-author, um, uh, James White, in the, uh, in, in the front row. And so I will turn it over to you. Uh, Thanks, Siamak. Thank you very much. OK, so, um, so great. We're going to cover a lot of ground quickly and then just have time for, uh, for lots of questions as well. So it's great, great to be here. Um, you know, I think it's my fourth time talking about this topic here at, at Columbia. And um, the, um, the title, How Much of a Good Thing is Best for You, um, is, is really what we're going to be talking about. We're going to be talking about this how much question. Um, and so I suspect that as you learn about uh, finance, that the, the focus of um, of what we're taught and what the research is in finance is very much about what should we invest in, right? We sort of have the moder modern portfolio theory. If we look at um, the, um, if, we, if we think about the, the main messages of modern portfolio theory, you know, it's looking at uh, return and risk and sort of getting us to this idea of the market portfolio. Um, and, uh, you know, and then we go on to, you know, um, these other well-known topics. So a lot of times when I start this talk or um, to, to, uh, to cover this topic, I ask people like, how many people have seen this equation and kind of know what it is? And I bet, let's get a little show of hands. So not most or people are, uh, oh, good Harry, I'm glad. <laughs> I'm glad you've seen it. I've never seen <laughs> Um, anyway, you know, these are all, you know, I think these are all things that, these are all equations that you're going to see uh, that I would be surprised if you don't come across in an introduction to finance class. You know, maybe Black-Scholes is not quite in the introduction, but, you know, uh, present valuing formulas, dividend discount. But, um, and even this last one, the Sharpe ratio, you know, is, is right out of, um, is right out of modern portfolio theory. But, you know, what about this one? Like, how many people have seen this? You know, in general, you know, um, you know we tend to find, I mean, I, I hadn't seen, how about this? Uh, I worked in finance for close to 20 years and I didn't, and I hadn't seen it. So I went to the London School of Economics. I studied finance there and, uh, um, and economics for three years. I never saw that. And I never saw this either until much more recently. And these are really important um, concepts to have, to have, or rules of thumb to have. The first one is a simplification of the Kelly criterion, which is saying that if you're betting on a biased coin, that the optimal amount to bet is equal to the probability of winning minus the probability of losing. Um, and the second one is a more generalized form of that. Uh, we call it the Merton share. And it says that the, uh, that the amount of the, the fraction of your portfolio, if you're living in a world of one uh, risky asset and one safe asset, um, that the amount that you should invest in that risky asset is equal to its excess expected return, mu, divided by the variance of the returns of that asset, sigma squared, and also divided by gamma, your coefficient of risk aversion, and um, you know, more, more on that. Um, so you know, on the on the um, you know on the left side is this whole what question? What should we invest in the selection question? And on the right is the how much question. And uh, you know James and I felt that this how much question wasn't getting um, you know nearly as much um, attention and, and focus as it as as it um, 
as it should. So we decided to write this book that um, is almost entirely on this topic. We take a couple of small uh, detours to, uh, since we figured we'd only write one book in our lives, we decided to also dump in some other ideas. <laughs> away from the how much question and you know this is what I mean like if you're you know if you you've, you've, I'm sure you've all seen this you know this is our sort of the the cornerstone of modern portfolio theory um, you know we have this efficient frontier we have this line that we draw uh, that's the capital asset uh, market line and that's where investors should uh, be invested so if you're a hundred percent in equities, you know, you're right at the intersection or right at the tangent point. Um, but, you know, but you might want to just have half of your money in equities and, uh, or in the risky portfolio and half in the safe asset. Or you might want to be leveraged and have one and a half times your, your, um, you know, your money in equities and be borrowing 50%. And, you know, the Nobel Prizes went out for this, this diagram and the ideas behind it. But the... Um, um, but there wasn't much written about how should people decide where on the line they should be. It was just stated that people will decide where to be on the line, you know, based on their degree of risk preferences. Um, it was kind of left at that. And then, you know, that sort of, uh, um, you know, people went further than that and started to think about asset pricing in general, you know, in, our, in, the, whole, uh, um, in the whole economy. Um, and you know what would be where's the right equilibrium assuming that investors all have the same risk preference or they have you know a range of risk preferences and so on but when we're taught this you know it's sort of where you are on that line is not really discussed that much it's just you're going to be somewhere depending on where you want to be and we think that you know that, that it really warrants a lot more discussion and thought um, so I don't know if we're going to get through all of these things in the in the uh, discussion, but um, you know I think that um, if we can if we can leave you with some of these uh, with um, if we can leave you with this kind of roadmap um, that we're going to start off talking about coin flipping. Um, we're going to introduce the concept of utility, which you probably know already. We're going to talk a little bit about the uh, the magical properties of expected utility, and I think that we probably. Um, are not going to get into the multi-period unless we you know, want to have some discussion of that and we probably won't go, th I mean I'm, I'll throw up some examples um, but let's use more time for questions uh, you know, as well and, um, and, I'll, and the deck, you know, this, this deck will be with Siamak and Harry if you guys, um, if anybody wants to go back to it. So. Um, I don't know if, if uh, in, in past um, visits to Colombia we'd have uh, um, people play our coin flip game. You know, this time around we asked you guys to play a different game that was similar to the coin flipping game, but not quite the coin flipping game. So in this coin flipping game that we came up with about six or seven years ago, or maybe more, I don't know, uh, Rich over here uh, and I, um, well, Rich programmed it up and, and we got uh, 61 uh, people, uh, some of them from Colombia, few, right? And from here and there, and some of them from a very large uh, bond uh, bond management firm, <laughs> and and you know some so we got some mix of professional finance people and and uh, uh, graduate students in finance to play this game, and basically we gave people twenty five dollars, and uh, and they could flip. We allowed them to flip this digital coin that had a sixty percent chance of landing on heads. We programmed it like that. We told everybody that was how we programmed it, and you could bet any fraction of your bankroll on it. And at the end of a half an hour, we'd pay you whatever uh, amount of money um, you had at the end of the half an hour. And uh, we built in a small delay into the game so that uh, um, people couldn't you know, get 500 or 800 bets down. And really importantly, we put a cap on the maximum payout of $250. Um, and we could talk a little bit more about that later. If we hadn't done that, um, I guess we'd both probably be broke many times over. So anyway, that's where you play the game if you want to give that a go. Um, so it kind of looks like that. You place your bet, it flips, um, and, uh, um, and we wrote it up and we got it into, the, into a journal that likes us. Um, and here's how um, people did. Well, yeah, 
yeah, you don't need to think about it too much. Um, anyway, here's how people did. They didn't do really well. So like uh, over 25% of the people who played it um, basically lost all the $25. And then, you know, another 5% or so lost money but didn't go all the way bust. And only uh, uh, just over 20% of the people maxed out above $200 or $250. And, um, and it turns out that if you just you know, like, I don't know, what, what's the simplest strategy, you know, I guess, what are the simplest strategies that you could think about, right? Like, one of them is, I'm just going to bet $2 every time, you know, type 2, press flip, <laughs> type 2, press flip. Presumably, you bet on heads every time, right? You know, um, actually, our, the players didn't tend to do that every time. They, they bet on heads a lot, but not every time. Um, Another thing that people were attracted to was sort of doubling down, right? So it's like, I'm going to bet $2. If I win, I'll bet $2 again. If I lose, I'll bet $4. Uh, if I lose, uh, then I'll bet $8, you know, et cetera, um, a doubling down strategy. So we saw all different kinds of things. Um, you know, we saw people betting on tails. We saw people bet really small amount the whole time. We saw people betting all kinds of different things over time. And um, oh, it won't go there. Um, but, but people did really poorly and somehow we sort of connected this. Now it was just a game with $25, right? And you know, it doesn't say a lot about how we make big financial decisions in, in our lives, but it does really kind of tell you that, um, that we don't really even know where to start in thinking about it. I mean, here's a favorable game. Um, it's kind of the simplest thing you could imagine in some ways. And, and, uh, you know, how much risk should you take there, you know, in the context of that game was just something that people didn't come at it with a bunch of tools. And I'm sure that if, um, you know, before learning about all this stuff, I'm sure that I would have been the same if I saw this game 30 years ago, I wouldn't, you know, and I'm under some time pressure, you know, God knows what I would have done because I didn't have a really good framework back then either. And, um, you know, this theme that size really matters, right? That, you know, you bet too small, you have a favorable opportunity, you bet too small, you're sort of just giving up on it. You know, you're not getting anything out of it. But if you bet too big, it really can bite you. And, um, you know, you can get into a situation that you just can't recover from. So like, here's um, just, here's, um, you know, just a quick simulation to give you an idea of how a few different betting strategies would have done with the coin flipping uh, betting. So if you bet uh, the second row down, like if you had bet 10% of your bankroll on every flip, so you bet two and a half dollars on the first flip, if you win, now you have 27 and a half dollars, you bet $28 on, uh, $28 on the next flip, etc. That would have given you a 94% probability of hitting that maximum 250 um, and an expected payout of 240, $240 altogether. So much better than, than people had done. And you can see that, um, I mean, even just betting $4 every time, you know, would have given a much higher expected outcome than people um, wound up with. Um, notice that if you bet 40%, that your expected outcome was $166. I mean, that's kind of giving us a hint right away that there's some sort of optimal sizing, right? And I mean, you could imagine, we'll get to this later, but you could imagine that if you bet 100% on every flip, <laughs> you know, you would almost have a 100% chance of losing all of your money. So in the context of this game, um, if you're doing constant fractional betting, there's, a, um, there's some uh, optimal fraction to, to bet. But what if we were betting with real money? What if we had, you know, a million dollars of starting wealth and, um, and somehow we were given an opportunity to bet on this coin? Well, you might say, gosh, that's so unrealistic, you know, when do we ever get to bet on a 60-40 coin? Well, actually, that's kind of what investing in the equity market is, isn't it? I mean, that the equity market is this, is this uh, sort of mega undiversifiable risk that we all face. You know, we believe that there's a risk premium. We can kind of see it, that, that there's a risk premium there too, in a way, because uh, not only historically have equities generated higher returns than safer assets, but prospectively we can look at all these companies out there that we can invest in and uh, you know the there's an earnings yield that we can look at we know that we could buy equities you know say for 25 times uh, their expected earnings we think they can grow their earnings um, with um, uh, let's say we believe they can grow their earnings with inflation even if they paid out all of their earnings as dividends when that kind of tells us that maybe equities have a four percent 
uh, that are offering like a 4% return above inflation, but on bonds, we can only get about 2%. So right there, you could even see it prospectively. Um, so, so betting on equities is something that's like a biased coin. You know, it's not exactly like a biased coin. It's not binary. It's not exactly knowable what the probabilities are, but it's a lot like betting on a biased coin. So let's, um, with that in mind, let's just take a, just think about this a little bit. You know, what if we were betting on the 60-40 coin and we're trying to decide between these different betting uh, fractions, right? So we know that, um, let's think about just the expected return per flip um, and, and then we'll also convert that into an expected value at the end. So if you bet 10% of your wealth on each flip, right? then your expected gain is you have a 60% chance of winning 10%, a 40% chance of losing 10%. So 60 times 10 minus 40 times 10 is like 20 times 10, which is 2%, right? So, and if we bet 20% on each flip, the expected gain of, in our wealth per flip is 4% per flip. And what we've done there below is we say, okay, you have 100 flips, so if you're making 2% on every flip, after 100 flips, your expected gain is 7.2 times your starting wealth and 51 times your starting wealth in that second one. How about if we go to 50%? Well, it just goes higher, right? Uh, you know, now we have a 10% expected return on each flip, an expected, an expected uh, uh, wealth at the end of $13.8 billion if we got to flip this 100 times. That sounds pretty good. Does that sound better than the 20 per betting 20%? So far it does, right? Well, this is where we know that something's going wrong because if we bet 100% of our wealth on every flip, we have a 20% expected gain on every flip and, we're, and, and that would take us up to $83 trillion of expected value. But we know that that can't be a good strategy, right? <laughs> Like we know that that you know that there's a one a one in a billion chance that we survive. Well, with a hundred flips, it's even it's um, it's it's much lower probability than that that we survive a, that we get a hundred heads in a row, even with the biased coin. So, what's nice to think about as a starting point is well, what if we just get the expected number of heads? What if we got sixty heads? We're flipping it a hundred times. We get sixty heads and forty tails, right? That's, we'll call that the median or the mode. Well, in that case, if you bet 100%, you're gonna wind up with zero because you got at least one tails that wiped you out. But really kind of interesting, right? If you bet 50% on each flip and you get 60 heads and 40 tails, just as expected, you lose 97% uh, of your wealth. And, um, uh, but if you bet 20%, um, then you're making uh, 7.5 times your wealth and then it's lower for 10%. So you can see that there's like a hump here. There's an optimal, an optimal point, so to speak, if, if that's what we're interested in. I'm not suggesting that that necessarily is what we're interested in, but it's kind of a good start in the whole thing. So if we're thinking about the median outcome, the most likely outcome, uh, there is a maximum and that maximum, that's actually the Kelly criterion as we'll come to later or, or, or maybe not, but, but that's, the, uh, that's your highest rate of wealth growth. Yes? How come on the prior slide it wasn't monotonic? Is that because of the cap? Uh, 30% making less money in expectation than 20%. Yeah. Uh, um, yeah. It's yeah, it's because of the cap, yep. Yes, good. Good observation. Yeah, I mean the opti You know, if you're just playing for twenty-five dollars with a two-fifty cap, uh, we've had some really interesting conversations, and people have written stuff up in in different journals. People actually got really into the game, and they're like, "What's the optimal strategy? The absolute optimal?" And uh, and and yeah, people have come up with some pretty cool math uh, solutions to the whole thing. Um, so. So what's going on with that 50% bet size, right? What's going on is that if you make 50% and you lose 50%, you know, you don't get back to zero, you're down 25%, right? And, and so, you know, at some point, this, this, this drag, this volatility drag that's coming, you know, from making a certain percent and then losing that same percent and taking you further down is outweighing um, the expected gain, right? The expected gain was going up in that other chart, right? It was like 2%, 4%, uh, 
10%, 20%, right? That was the expected gain for flip, per flip. But, the, um, but this variance drag in this other direction is also getting bigger, and it's getting bigger quadratically, actually. So that's what's giving us our, um, our max. So, um, you know, that, that if you're playing for real money, um, you say, okay, well, if I bet 20% on this coin, that's giving me my highest median outcome. But maybe you want to look at a whole bunch of different aspects of the distribution, like, uh, you know, what's the probability that I lose 80% of my wealth? Now we've, by the way, we've switched over to 25 flips to make it starting to get a little bit more realistic. So with 25 flips, like what's the probability of losing 80% or more of my wealth? Well, if I bet 5% on 25 flips, I just can't lose 80% of my wealth. If I bet 10%, um, there's a really small probability, right? Just uh, um, a half a basis point. But if I bet 20% of my wealth on 25 flips, there's a 3% chance that I actually wind up losing 80% or more of my wealth. So when you look at all these numbers, and we won't go through them in detail, you know, it's sort of building up a picture where you might say, hey, you know, betting 20% is too big. And, and, and now it kind of becomes a preference. Like what, you know, where do we want to be, you know, in this distribution? You know, what kind of distribution of outcomes do I like the best? And, um, you know, one way of going at it is just looking at a bunch of the different statistics of each different kind of uh, um, betting strategy or sizing strategy. And, um, you know, what, uh, what James and I have found from a lot of conversations with different people and also just our own introspection is that that 20%, you know, that, that making, uh, you know, the 20% the, the, uh, or maximizing a risk preference that tries to maximize the growth of your wealth, the Kelly criterion, the highest median outcome, it's kind of too risky. You know, that, that 20%, anyway, for, for me, for James, for other people, that 20% is, is a little bit, uh, betting 20% in this case is just a little bit too risky. I mean, it kind of bugs me that, um, you know, 60, if you get heads 15 times out of 25, right, that's your median outcome. Uh, and that's great. You know, if that happens, right, I'm going to make $1.6 million from my, I'm going to make $600,000, a really nice return. That's great. But if I just get two heads less, I'm down almost 30%. If I got 13 heads instead of 15 heads, um, I've lost 30%. Like that's kind of seems scary uh, to me, you know, as well as some of those other numbers, you know, a 15% chance of losing, a 15% chance of losing um, more than 50% of my wealth, etc. So, but it's a question of taste and you could be anywhere there, which is now starting to get to this idea that there's a, a personal preference involved in making these uh, sizing decisions. So, um, so let's say that, um, so let's say that I wanted to bet 10% of my wealth on something that's like a 60, 40 outcome. Okay. Can I generalize that? Can I, can I get to a, to a rule, uh, that's, that's more general? What's the form of that rule going to, uh, to be? So in thinking it through, um, I, uh, you know, the, the, probably the easiest way to try to think about it is say, okay, sticking with these coin flips, right? Um, so let's say that um, I needed to get a side payment of 1% of my wealth to accept a 50-50 coin flip uh, that is, um, uh, that's, that's up or down 10%, right? So that's kind of like the 60, well, it's kind of like that 60-40 coin, except it's half the compensation for betting uh, 10% because what I'm, um, what I'm looking at here is kind of saying like, where would I be indifferent to the bet? But whatever, uh, let's just, and it also just makes the numbers a little bit easier looking at it like this. So if I, so if, um, if I need to be paid 1% to accept a 50-50 coin flip of making or losing 10% of my wealth, my question to you is how much compensation do I need um, to be willing to risk a coin flip of plus or minus 20%, right? So I, get, I need to get paid 1% to take plus or minus, to take 10% risk, to take 10% standard deviation of outcomes. How much do I need to get paid to take twice that much risk, right? Um, and I think that the most natural answer to that is twice as much, right? I would say, seems like that would, that might be where your head goes to begin with, but that's not right. Because, and the way to see that is, 
Um, what happens if I flip this coin four times? If I flip the coin four, four times, each time with plus or minus 10%, getting, and I'm getting compensated 1%. So I know if I flip it four times, my compensation is uh, four times one, that's 4%. But what's the standard deviation of flipping this plus or minus 10% coin, this coin that I'm betting 10% on four times? It's not 40%, it's 20%, right? That if I'm flipping, because there's, you, right, does that, a little, a little more head shaking, a little more <laughs> up and down, <laughs> right? So if I, right, so if I'm flipping a coin like that, I'm getting, um, <clears throat> you know, a bunch of times when the heads and tails are, if I'm flipping it four times, I'm getting all these times when the heads and tails are like canceling themselves out. Yes, I could get four heads in a row, I could get four tails in a row, but I have lots of uh, occasions where I don't go up or down because I got two heads and two tails in some combination. And anyway, you guys know that flipping a coin four times that the standard deviation is going up with the square root of the times that you're flipping it. Um, so I don't need to belabor the point. So what, we're, what we find from that little thought experiment is that uh, the compensation that I need to get is not proportional to the risk that I take, it's proportional to the risk squared, the variance of it, right? Um, so I guess I could have put that up slightly ahead of time <laughs> for you to read. Um, and, um, and so if there's like a, if, if there's, if that, if that uh, ratio of expected gain to the variance is a constant for me, right? That basically is defining my risk preference. I could say my risk preference, and I'm gonna call that my coefficient of risk aversion, um, is just this ratio of expected gain to variance that, um, that I like, you know, it's that, it's that proportion that I like. And, um, um, you know, if you have a chance, you know, look up uh, Robert Merton, 1969. Uh, it was his only paper that he published that year. And you'll find in that paper how he came to this, uh, this formula. And it was, uh, it was not at all like we just talked about here. <laughs> um, so, you know, this is what I was saying earlier. The Merton share for sizing is, uh, is equal to the expected excess return of your investment divided by uh, your coefficient of risk aversion and the variance of returns of, of that risky investment or portfolio that you're looking at. And, and, um, 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 and you know, as I was saying that the, uh, you know, we're using, we could say, well, if you're somebody that would like to bet 10% of your wealth on a 60-40 coin toss, well, then that's implying that your coefficient of risk aversion is two. Um, and, um, uh, you know, which, again, we kind of think that, you know, for a lot of people uh, that their risk aversion tends to be in this two to three range when asked about sort of risking money on coin flips and that sort of thing with discretionary wealth and uh, with some other assumptions. Um, so let's just apply it. Uh, let's apply it once, you know, maybe that will help to, I would love it if uh, you leave this lecture with um, knowing that there's something called a Merton share and, and uh, you, where you could look it up and, uh, and, and sort of how it works. Um, maybe come back to it later. So let's assume uh, an excess return of the stock market of 5%, uh, standard deviation of 20%, and a risk aversion of two. That should, we should be able to take those numbers and calculate what fraction of our wealth we would like to have in stocks versus the safe asset. So can somebody tell me what is uh, five divided by two divided by 0.2 squared? Come on, guys. Somebody. By, uh, not you. <laughs> right? So it's, well, it's 5 divided by uh, 20 squared is 0 0.04. 0 0.04 times 2 is 0 0.08. So 0 0.05 over 0 0.08 is 62 and a half. So good one. <laughs> so it's say, right? Which is kind of interesting. Like, the, I mean, doesn't that kind of seem... You know, you hear all about the 60-40 portfolio, having 60% of wealth and equities. I mean, it's kind of nice, you know, it's not, uh, it's not proving anything, but it's kind of nice how it, how it works, right? I mean, I don't know, intuitively, if I thought equities had a 5% excess return above uh, 
safe assets and that kind of risk. Yeah, I mean, that seems kind of reasonable uh, to me, I guess. Um, of course, you know, in the real world, we have taxes, we have, you know, non-normal distributions, we have, you know, different horizons, etc., where things could be a little bit different or, or a lot different. Um, and, um, and what if stock market risk were half? Well, you know, it's got to do with variance. So if stock market risk were half as big as the 20%, then you'd want to be um, not twice as exposed to stocks, but four times as exposed to stocks, um, you know, because it's this variance and not the standard deviation that matters. Um, you know, as we were showing in the earlier slides, sort of size on the x-axis and um, an expected gain um, going up on the, uh, um, on the y-axis, um, you know, here's what we get when, um, uh, you know, if we're, if we're um, I mean, maybe this is skipping ahead a little bit, but you could see what I was saying where the price of risk is going up quadratically, right? It's going up with, uh, with, the, with the variance, with the, with, with the size of your investment squared, um, whereas expected gain is going up linearly. And so we're going to get a chart that looks like this, where you have this optimal point of sizing, um, where um, uh, the, the optimal point being where this quadratic that's going up, you know, is, is, um, uh, you know, is, is producing sort of the reflection b uh, below. So, um, yeah, I think that, you know, if I could also, you know, that maybe the, you know, maybe the really central, central idea of this whole, uh, of this whole um, area is, is, that, uh, is that we can think about the cost of risk as being, um, as being equal to the, your coefficient of risk aversion times, uh, the variance of the the variance of the risk that you're taking, the risk that you're taking squared, divide, half of that divided by two, and you can kind of see that the I don't know that, that there's going to you know that in this quadratic you could see that the yellow line right is is hitting zero at twenty percent, and sort of it's maxing out halfway between zero and twenty. So I don't know if that helps at all to think about there being a half in there, but <clears throat> if um, that if once you have a if you have if you believe that the cost of risk is equal to uh, your coefficient of risk aversion divided by two times the variance of the risk that you're taking, like everything else falls out from that, right? You could just write uh, an equation that says, well, what's my risk-adjusted return, right? It's my expected return minus my uh, cost of risk, and then you could say, okay, well, what? Uh, and you could write that as a function of how much you're investing in that risky asset. And then you could just say, okay, uh, what, what, uh, what size investment maximizes that? And you can just work back and that will throw out the Merton share um, as, as the answer to that. So if you just, if, if you have that, it really helps you to regenerate all of these ideas that we're talking about. Um, now, all of this conversation we've just had, I mean, we talk about a coefficient of risk aversion, but we haven't really gone into any of the underlying theory, right? And all of this underlying theory, so we've talked about everything without talking about a utility curve, right? Um, you know, what do we mean by a utility curve and what's the normal shape of it? Uh, by a utility curve, we mean some sort of mapping between either our wealth or our spending, you know, into sort of how much welfare or happiness or contentment it's giving us. And in general, for most situations, and certainly involving money to a large extent, uh, you know, we believe that most people have a decreasing marginal uh, utility of wealth or spending, right? Like, um, I mean, you can certainly see it, you know, with, um, with things that you eat, <laughs> you know, that the more that we eat of something, the less we want to have an incremental unit of it. And the same with wealth. I mean, that more wealth is better than uh, less wealth, but uh, your first million dollars is going to be less, uh, sorry, is going to be more life changing than your second million dollars and so on. And so that we, you know, that it's very normal and natural to have this concave uh, uh, sort of utility mapping from wealth to utility. And once you have that, you can see why uh, we are naturally risk averse, right? Which is because a gain uh, doesn't give us as much of an increase in utility as a loss gives us a decrease in utility. Um, 
and sort of everything can be, um, you know, we can kind of go from there to a lot of other um, economic theories. Um, that particular curve that we were showing there, I mean, you could have all kinds of utility curves, all kinds of concave utility curves. Um, the one that we like and the one that uh, was shown there is what's called constant relative risk aversion utility. This is one way of writing it. There's other ways um, to write it as well that are equivalent. And um, I think that um, we're kind of getting to, here's uh, you know, a bunch of different utility curves, including ones that are, the blue one is convex. That's, a, that's somebody who's risk seeking which when somebody is risk seeking, you know, it's possible for somebody to have those preferences. Um, they just don't stay rich for very long when, <laughs> when you have, I mean, if you're acting according to risk seeking utility, uh, you would seek out uh, risk, even if it has a negative expected return. And there'll be lots of people that will be happy to, to give you those opportunities. So it doesn't, you know, it's not something that you're going to observe in the wild for, for long, at least people applying it really um, consistently across all their financial decisions. Um, and um, yeah, I mean, you know, I think that uh, it seems natural to use uh, this expected utility to make your financial decisions, but there's a whole literature on, on the conditions under which that is actually sort of provable to be optimal. And I would encourage you to, to take a look on Wiki or here or there. Um, you know, looking at the axioms of rational choice that were first, the first set of these axioms were thrown out by uh, von Neumann and Morgenstern in the 1940s and got the whole, um, you know, at the same time got the whole um, subject area of game theory going, at least um, gave it a really big push. Um, okay, so let's see, I think, um, this, was, this is a, a spreadsheet, just like a little spreadsheet to show you how you would actually do this if you were looking at some gambles or choices, you know, how you would just set it up in a spreadsheet um, with your utility function and just searching for, uh, for bet sizes that maximize your expected utility. So I think I'm going to just try to find, this is, we, we said we'd sort of um, skip over this. There's a whole other area of the literature extending this into a multi-period intertemporal framework and I'm going to sort of skip over that. Um, and here's just a lot of problems. There's, there's so many problems that we face in our personal financial lives that, um, that, that cannot be answered by just thinking about the central case or thinking about, I want to minimize the probability of this bad thing happening or I want to maximize the probability of this good thing happening. That whenever you are facing choices under uncertainty, you really have to take account of um, the full range of possibilities that can happen and have some sort of mapping between those things happening and how they're going to make you feel to come up with the best decision. And I think there's just, there's just so many uh, places where, um, and so many places where in practice people are just looking at central cases to make financial decisions. You know, should I realize capital gains now or should I defer my capital gains? Um, by holding an appreciated asset for longer. And, you know, the way that the natural way that people might approach that is to say, well, if I, uh, I'm just going to calculate under what uh, decision I'm going to have more money. Well, if I don't sell the asset and don't pay the capital gains tax today, then, um, you know, I'm sort of borrowing from the government and that's going to take me, uh, you know, I take that into the future. I'm going to have more money assuming tax rates don't go up. And then it's like, well, maybe I think tax rates are going to go up. And you do this whole central base case analysis, but you've ignored the fact that risk is a really integral component to the whole, to the whole thing. So, um, you know, this is just a very partial list of things. Um, but I don't know, it feels like it would be a good place to, yeah, it feels like a good place to open up to questions. And I thought maybe James and I could both answer questions, you know, the harder ones for James, and I'll take some of the easier ones. Um, so, yes, yeah, Mike. So, uh, I think uh, this is a very elegant mathematical framework for thinking about investment, like especially in the context of uh, like a coin game where you know all the outcomes. But in reality, you need to know like mu and sigma and so on, especially mu, right? So, your answer would be different for how much to invest in the stock market if you think it's going to go have an excess return of 5% versus 2% versus 10%. So, how do you, how do you factor that in into sort of a, a practical?
uh, application of that role. Okay. Go, go for it, James. I'll just get it. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm, I'm going to answer that in two ways. One, for the stock market, and the other, in general. So let's say it's not the stock market. Let's just say it's some general investment. I, I would say if you're looking at investing in something, and you can't even schematically at some high level specify what you think the distribution of outcomes is, then the, what are you doing investing in? To a certain extent, the whole process of making investment decisions or analyzing investments is coming to some conclusion about what the distribution of outcomes is. And um, if you have an arbitrary distribution of outcomes, maybe not even a continuous density function, but just, you know, I think a 30% chance of up 100%, a 10% chance of up 50%, a 10% chance of down 50%. You know, if you can specify the distribution of outcomes in any way, in any arbitrary way, you don't get a nice formula, but you can still use the general framework of optimizing expected utility. Um, so that's one. Th that's. Do people need media? Uh, I think it's for. I think it's because they're recording it. Oh, so okay. Oh, okay. yeah, yeah. Um, so that's 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 a really nice feature of the framework. That in cases where you have geometric Brownian motion and you have <coughs> CRA utility and you have really nice setup, you get some nice formulas. But um, but the, f the mechanics of using the framework don't really rely on it and are actually still quite easy for arbitrary return distributions, arbitrary utility, you know, whatever you want to throw into it. Now, in the case of the stock market specifically, um, we feel that uh, the preferred metric for forward-looking real returns is something like cyclically adjusted earnings yields. You know, different people have different estimates. Anybody could have their own idiosyncratic estimate they throw in. Um, we tend to think that there are certain classes of investments that lend themselves more naturally to having decent expected return forecasts and some that don't, you know, so for instance, a treasury bond. Um, you know, or an inflation-adjusted treasury bond, even more, you know, is something that has like a very, very sharp estimate of expected real return. Um, you know, a venture capital investment in um, a, a company that has no product and is just an idea, you know, has a much wider, uh, a much probably more radically uncertain distribution of expected returns. And, you know, most assets fall somewhere in the middle where, you know, you don't, um, you, don't, uh, you don't know the expected return. That's why there's a sigma in there, too. But there's usually some relatively decent process for, for getting to a decent input. And one of the somewhat um, surprising results from applying the theory of parameter uncertainty to the framework is that, you know, let's say I, I have some uncertainty about my input parameter. So let's say I know the vol is 20%, but I think it's, you know, there's some distribution of likelihood that it's maybe a 3% mu, a 5% mu, or a 7% mu. And, you know, I don't know which I'm going to get. Um, it's actually very well behaved under those, cir those circumstances where you can use the expected value of the input, uh, you know, given a distribution of inputs, and you're going to get very similar answers to your absolutely knowing what the distribution is. Now, that won't hold in the case of really, really, really strongly asymmetric distributions and whatnot. But. Okay. Um, yeah, I think, you know, one thing, sorry, is there another question for now? You guys saving, saving them up for the very end? Oh, okay. Go ahead. Um, what about like when you have fat tails like in the distribution? Would you be able to work that into this model? Yeah. So um, there's there's um, there's kind of two ways you can think about it. You know, the if you want to use a formula, you know, like the Merton rule. Well, the formula assumes geometric Brownian motion, which doesn't have fat tails, right? So you can if you want to use a simple rule of thumb, you know, you can kind of use a variance adjustment. But the full credit way to do it is instead of um, 
using a rule of thumb, you would just directly optimize your expected utility using the exact return distribution um, that you want. So if you have some specification for how, ha how fat the tail is, uh, you c if you can generate that either by simulation or by specifying the return distribution directly. If you can specify the return distribution, then you can specify the distribution of utilities. You have the utility function, so you can translate a value distribution to utility distribution. You have the utility distribution, you can convert, you can compute expected utility, and then you find the, you know, whatever the size is that optimizes your expected utility. So the framework is really distribution <coughs> agnostic. Yep. Harry? Yep. Um, so what are your thoughts on the Merck formula when it calls for leverage? Like you have the example of 250% invested in the risky asset. So like if, if you're giving an investor advice and there's some are, you know, like 60, 40 is fine, but what if the amount of risk they want to take gets them to like 200% invested in the risky asset and they have to lever? You know, Go for it. <laughs> yeah, no, I think that's a, that's a really good question. And, you know, I think that um, the, um, um, that the, you know, the framework is, is uh, you know, sort of really helps you to, uh, to think it through. So if you have, if it's calling for 250% leverage from the Merton share, you know, you realize that, well, what's the Merton share missing, right? That the Merton share uh, as a formula is assuming continuous time, continuous rebalancing, no gap movements in it, et cetera. But you know that if you have 250% uh, leverage that, um, that you're, you know, what happens if you wake up one day and the stock market's down 20%? You're like wiped out. You haven't had a chance to respond at all. So, um, you know, the, uh, the Merton share is kind of this rule of thumb that's nice to start to think about things. But when you're making, you know, big consequential decisions for yourself, um, you know, you need to use this utility framework uh, with all the realism that you can bring into it. And, you know, in many cases, um, you know, it's going to, take you to, um, you know, that, that um, the rebalancing, the, uh, the gap rebalancing risk, the fat tails, uh, the costs of leverage, all of those things will tend to push you down. You know, for, uh, for us, when we talk to clients, we say, you know, you can make enough money without being leveraged. I mean, I think that leverage, some small leverage can make sense given certain people's preferences in certain situations of expected return. But, you know, I don't think you're foregoing that much. And, I don't know if you ever saw the book. Um, you know, one of the things that's kind of fun at the beginning of our of, of our book, in the preface, we talk about how, um, you know, every single textbook in finance is really saying the same thing. Like that, when it comes to teaching finance, particularly at the graduate level, like all the textbooks agree with each other. But then, when these same professors who are like writing the textbooks or teaching from the textbooks when they write a personal finance book, they can really diverge dramatically. So we have, um, you know, like um, Barry Nailbuff and, uh, and, and um, his co-author Ayers, you know, wrote a book that's kind of telling people, especially young people, you know, you should get like three times leverage in equities using call options. And then, you know, another uh, professor from the same, you know, also from MIT, you know, also went to MIT, he writes a book that just says, you know, everybody should just invest in tips. But not everybody, I guess he means the readers of the book should invest in tips. And it's just amazing, like how did these two guys, and they both, well, they didn't study under the same professor, but they both would teach from the same textbooks. And, uh, and, and the explanation is, you know, that it, it kind of depends on your assumption. So what, like in the book, one of the things that we try to say is that, um, you know, we really want people reading this book to get a framework to then make their decisions according to their inputs and preferences and their understanding of things, that there's not like a one size uh, fits all. Um, um, anyway, there's one thing that I'd like to, or one or two things, uh, depending on how many more questions or how many more urgent questions there are that I thought would be also a little bit fun to talk about. You know, one is, the title of the book is The Missing Billionaires, and, and you know, we sort of got into this whole topic through the coin flip game and, and how um, you know, people um, weren't well equipped for the coin flipping. And, and in some ways, the missing billionaire parable that the book starts out with 
is similar to that, that we're noticing, that, we, that, that we're remarking that uh, it seems as though very wealthy people historically uh, have not been able to uh, do as well as you might imagine they would do with their wealth. And in particular, um, the, um, uh, you know, the, what we notice is that back in 1900, there were lots of wealthy families in America with a uh, million dollars or more. There were like 4,000 families in the census back then uh, that, um, th that had more than a million dollars. And we figure that you know, like a thousand of them had more than five million dollars. And we know that you know, there were Vanderbilts and Astors and other families and, and, uh, and Morgans and so on that had, you know, like a hundred million dollars. So if you look back then and see that distribution of wealth and imagine that those people uh, invested wisely, spent, spent uh, generously from their money, paid some taxes as well, and had lots of children, that the investment environment over the last 120 years has been so great in America that um, you know, even with spending and even with having lots of kids and even with paying some taxes, that those thousand families, let's say, that had more than five million dollars back then should have generated like 16,000 families today that have more than a billion dollars. And when you look at the Forbes uh, rich list, um, there's like not one person or you know, more or less, there's not one person on that list, you know, that, um, that, that traces back to a fortune in 1900. And that really got us thinking about what's, what, is the pro what is the problem? Was it fees? Was it taxes? Did they have a lot more children or what was it? And, um, and what we've really come to believe, our hypothesis, and we can't really totally test it out. I mean, we don't know what happened in many of these cases. And even the ones where there are books like the Vanderbilts, there's two books written about the Vanderbilt family, but they don't give us quite enough detail. But our hypothesis is that, um, that people are just not well equipped to make good risk decisions uh, over long periods of time. Um, and, um, and just to give you like just a little toy example um, and this gets into this intertemporal thinking a little bit too. And you know, we didn't have time to really go through. I mean, there's so much in this in this area of research. But just to give you a little toy example, okay? So the the stock market return over the last 120 years was 10% a year. So that turned um, 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 that would have turned a million dollars in 1900 uh, if you had grown it and reinvested dividends into over 100 billion dollars today. So that's 10%. That's a great return, right? Um, and so, so let's say that you were uh, the Jura family, and um, uh, you know you've got um, you, you know you've got you're pretty wealthy, and uh, and you believe that the stock market is going to make a ten, that investing in stocks that you're going to get a 10% return uh, over the long term. Okay, so you're like, wow, you're pretty bullish on everything. Oh, and by the way, let's assume inflation of 3%. So maybe I should just be saying, call it a 7% real return. So let's say that you think stocks are going to have a 7% real return. Um, but um, you don't like investing in, in the broad market portfolio. You know, you like picking stocks. So you pick a portfolio of the stocks. You know, you've been reading Warren Buffett's missives for a long time. And, and uh, Peter Lynch and all these guys, and you decided you're going to buy these really good companies and hold them for the long term. So you buy, you know, and, and, and uh, you know, maybe you're an electrical engineer uh, or, uh, or whatever. And, and so you buy a set of stocks where you kind of understand, you think you understand their businesses pretty well. So you buy this portfolio of eight stocks, you put your money into that, you think that you're going to get this expected return of 7% after inflation in the long term. Um, but the problem is that this portfolio is riskier than, uh, than the stock market is because it's more concentrated. So instead of having stock market risk of like 15 to 20%, let's say that this portfolio has a standard deviation of returns of 30%. So it's got 7% uh, return above inflation, 30% annual variability. And, and uh, the whole reason that you worked so hard to get all this wealth is you want to spend it over time, right? So you have a spent, you come up with this spending rule and you say, well, geez, okay, I'm pretty wealthy. I can afford to spend, uh, let's say I'm, I can afford to spend 3% of my wealth each year 
um, and I have to pay taxes on that, so it's going to cost me like four and a half percent. So I'm going to I'm going to take four and a half percent out of my portfolio, pay my tax on it, and spend it. And you would say that seems kind of reasonable, right? Like if you were a billionaire or something, or if you were a millionaire back in 1900, like that might have been a reasonable setup for you. Like how bad is that, or how or or not how or how not bad is that? Well, it turns out that that's like terrible. That if you if you uh, let's say if you had um, you know, a million dollars and uh, and you said, OK, I'm going to invest it in these stocks and I'm going to spend uh, I'm going to spend uh, thirty five thousand uh, dollars a year out of that. That's the three that three and a half percent. But I'm going to spend thirty five thousand dollars and adjusted for inflation. But my stocks are also getting the inflation thing going on. After twenty five years, um, you would have a greater than 50 percent chance of being out of money because what's happening is that You've got these two things that are subtly but viciously eating at your wealth. The first one is right that we know that if you go up 30% and then down 30%, or if you go up 37%, right, and then and then down 30% from there. So you have one year of return that's plus 37, and the next year is minus 23. That your average return, your average compound return, isn't 7%, even though your average arithmetic return is 7%. Your compound return is like two and a half percent. So you've got this just a two and a half percent compound return, but you're taking four you're taking four dollars and fifty cents out of your uh, portfolio every year to pay to get to the three dollars of the hundred that you're um, spent that you want to spend. And um, as your portfolio goes up or down, you're not adjusting up or down your spending. You're just spending this. Uh, uh, $35,000 a year on a million adjusted for inflation. And those two effects combine to wipe you out after, um, uh, you know, after 25 years with a 50% probability. And, and the probability goes up after that. And so, you know, I think that's like, that's what we think is one of the, uh, has been one of the problems in, in wealth management over long periods of time is people, taking risk, not like charging themselves for taking idiosyncratic risk that's not giving them extra return, taking too much risk, taking risk they're not getting compensated for, and combining that with a lifetime spending policy that's relatively rigid. Um, uh, rigid or even worse than rigid is like, you know, just has an upward uh, drift to it. And, um, you know, those things are like totally fine for five years. But after 30 or 40 years, they're kind of disastrous. And, you know, I mean, again, it's a hypothesis. We don't know, uh, you know, if that explains everything that we see, uh, you know, in terms of this intergenerational wealth. But we think, um, we think it's at play in there anyway. So I wanted to leave you with that little sort of toy example. Um, I don't know, have we gone a little bit over? A little bit. Okay. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Anyway, we'll hang out for a few more minutes. I don't know if the room, if there's other people coming into the room, but we could hang out for a little bit and let the rest of you go. So anyway, thank you very much.